Welcome to the last talk show's Holiday Simpsons Spectacular. Tonight's guests, Allie Gertz and Julia Prescott, who wrote the book 100 Things Simpsons Fans Must Do Before They Die, and host the podcast, Round Springfield. Also, executive producer of The Simpsons, Matt Selman, is joining us, plus Ira Kaplan from Yola Tingo with an amazing story, and 30 kids from the 3 O'Clock Rock after-school program sponsored by Muzak, or partly sponsored by Muzak, um, with some songs and Simpsons stuff. So join us, enjoy, happy holidays. All the way from the island of Nantucket, Massachusetts, it's Last Talk Show! Last Talk Show! Julia, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Thanks for thanks for joining us on a Sunday morning. And yeah. Allie, great to see you. And Matt, Thank you. good to see you too. Everybody. Hey Matt. Hey guys. How's it going? Going good. Going good. Let's start with a hundred things to know about the Simpsons before you die. The book you, you uh, Allie and Julia wrote, and in writing it, what was the most? What's your top thing that everyone should know? And what was the most surprising thing you found in researching it? That's a really good question. Um, one of the things that's the most relevant is um, I did a chapter that everyone should try to write a Simpsons song, which is probably uh, one that if you don't play an instrument, and you're like, fuck you. I guess this is a show for kids, so I shouldn't say that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just think it's a really fun chapter and writing about it, I was looking at that band. Um, they're like a punk rock or metal band that is all dressed up as Ned Flanders, which was really cool. Mm -hmm. And oh yeah, oh Kelly, yeah. don't Kelly. <laughs> yeah. How about <laughs> you, Julia? Yeah, I mean, in the research of the book and, and finding out, you know, the different things to include, um, a lot of merch items that I truly didn't know existed, and now I have uh, one that I like. It's in my possession now, and it's one of my most prized possessions. I have a Simpsons Christmas Village, which I really should have brought out. <laughs> but I, I ended up getting it in like the most Simpsons way. Uh, a friend of a friend was going through a divorce, and he had to downsize. And I love so he wanted, he wanted the Simpsons Village to go to a proper home. So I don't know. There's something about like a broken marriage giving me joy through Simpsons items. It feels appropriate. I don't know. It's very <laughs> Millhouse's dad. <laughs> yeah. Um, we all benefit when friends of ours who don't belong together break up. Absolutely. Yes, we do. <laughs> it's not a failure. It's really not. It's no, a child of divorce. I have to. I have to say that. <laughs> and Matt, Matt, have you read their book? You know their book, right? Yeah, sure, yeah. I read it. It's great. Who couldn't love their passion for the show? I, I wish I still had it. <laughs> <laughs> um. um no, I still have it. Um, it. It makes a great Christmas gift mm -hmm. and is available on Amazon. I'll just plug it. Why not? So if you are looking for a really good Simpsons book, the Springfield Confidential is, is a really great one. And That's a good like, one. Really, like, ours is like a really, like, just an upbeat, fun, like, we're fans of the show, but Springfield Confidential is like, that's actually, you're getting a lot of, like, insight that could only come from someone who's actually, like, really been on the show so is that the Mike Reese great one? Yeah. yeah that's Mike Reese's book yeah when he was on our show on our podcast that we host uh our books were about to come out and he just kept saying how much better his book was gonna be <laughs> which is so <laughs> mean because like of course it is <laughs> you don't need to say that <laughs> Mike Reese is one of the meanest people in the world in the world <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you're saying it he's such a fucking asshole I really wanted to come in guns a blazing <laughs> Never <laughs> smiles, never tells stories about as many travels that will delight and dazzle you. I hate it. Never <laughs> laughs about life and just enjoys the ride. I, <laughs> also, I just want to ask you guys about Round Springfield. Your podcast, how many episodes have you done? Well, we started the podcast um, uh, in a different format, and that's our kind of, uh, that's the podcast that got us to where we're today, and it was called uh, Everything's Coming Up Simpsons, and that one, Julia, that was years, so I think we got to 
I don't know. We we at least did over 150. I think we did a lot. Oh my god, more. We did a lot. I don't know. <laughs> Two hundred like four years. Somewhere between 106,000 episodes. But <laughs> I have a podcast, a little bit of podcast Simpsons humor. Mm. But I, can I can I screen share in this tonic or is that? Please. Will that work? I don't know. Let's try. It. <laughs> <laughs> so there's an issue of. Podcast Quarterly Magazine, a very thick <laughs> magazine. I guess I'll just read the jokes here. One is, <laughs> one is uh, 10 hot tips to bring the conversation back to you. <laughs> Great. Um, garage or basement, the debate continues. <laughs> um, thank you for your laughs. And an oral history of how I got into comedy oral histories. <laughs> it was really fun because we would have people on um, who were friends of ours, and then we would eventually get lucky enough to actually become uh, closer to some of the people who actually work on the show. Matt has been on the show. We went uh, to your house when you had a bad back, and that was very fun. Right, Donna knows all about that. <laughs> Matt, do you want to share it really quick? I just, <laughs> I, I've been working out a lot, <laughs> and then I hubristically was in an article in the New York Times about like funny workouts. Because, and then like a month later, I had a super herniated disc and my wife had a horrible flu. So I, I called Donick, who lives two blocks away, lived two blocks away. And he took me to the weird urgent care, and listened to me scream and try, to pee, <laughs> and try to pee into a thing. And I was honored that I was someone you felt like you could call because Matt's a very confident guy. He runs The Simpsons. He does very well in his career. He's got a wonderful family. He's got lots of great opinions on everything and never, never shy about stuff. And suddenly was on the phone going like, I, I think I'm dying. I don't know what to do. I need to <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Can we circle back to what a funny workout is, Matt? <laughs> what? Um, well, it wasn't, it, was, it wasn't a funny workout. It was, the hook was that kind of a fit guy works on a show writing for a out of shape guy. Oh, gotcha, so, like gotcha. that was the, the Wall Street Journal, like that was a, more than enough for them to think that was enough of a hook. They're like, oh, right. he writes jokes about eating floor pie and, you know, American yeah, yeah. And fried chicken all day. And, but, but in reality, he loves to work out. Yeah. I, was, I used to write clickbait. I know that it, all it takes is like right. a song and the wind to carry you yeah. to a uh, <laughs> green light on one of those articles. <laughs> uh, Allie, did you want to share a song or had a little snippet of a song you wanted to share before we go much further? Yeah, I mean, I was just going to um, have you maybe add it in after since there's like a little video for it. Uh, sure. But should we all pretend that we listened to it and, and you could decide whether or not you liked it or not in your acting of it? Great, let's do, a, let's do a setup. So, so Allie, tell us what we're about to watch. So uh, this is a song that I wrote uh, uh, about Santa's Little Helper. I believe the title is as uh, creative as Santa's Little Helper. Um, and it is kind of a little Christmas song and it, and it is part of a, um, a charity album that I did uh, uh, a few years ago. Um, basically every single artist, uh, it's a compilation, uh, wrote a song about a dog from uh, pop culture and then all that money went to um, ASPCA and helped out the dogs who were being uh, displaced from uh, whatever the hurricane was at the time which I can't remember but hopefully they're all doing better I'm so sorry <laughs> hurricane people I'm sorry I mean in in your defense a lot has happened a lot has happened <laughs> um so yeah, so this this song um, uh, has a little bit of a Christmas bent, and it's a, it's a much happier song than my song about Millhouse, and I didn't want to bum everybody out. So here we go.
song. Hey, uh, and it was fun. Want, if you want to watch the Millhouse song, that is also on YouTube. It's called Everything Is... Coming. Everything's Coming Up, Millhouse. Uh, yeah, and it's on my very regrettably titled uh, album, uh, Cosby Sweater. I didn't know. I didn't mm. know. What uh, happened? I don't know. I forget. It's been a long year. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, the sweaters are fine. They didn't. The sweaters do are great. Sweaters didn't do anything. <laughs> sweaters, yeah. <laughs> so let's let's talk Christmas and and holidays. Um, what are what's everybody's favorite Simpsons Christmas episodes and or Christmas holiday themed episodes? Uh, March be not proud. Is that one's such a emotional one. I really love <laughs> how relatable it is, just in terms of. I've been there. I've I, I haven't uh, fully shoplifted in such a way, but that guilt of like disappointing your yeah. mom—it's very real. Um, yeah, I always point to that one as like a really great example of because I know it's based off of Scully's um, childhood story, and you know it's it's such a great example of like using your own personal lived histories to you know like bring that heart element to uh, a TV story. So. And it's got jokes for days. It's it's so interesting that the show starts on a Christmas episode because it kind of just makes it feel like a Christmassy show. And um, I obviously love uh, a lot of the earlier ones, but I really also I really think the holidays of futures past is like such a cool and classic uh, feeling episode. And I love when the Simpsons uh, go to the future and we get a snapshot of how it could look and. It's a really, it's, it's kind of a tearjerker. It's, it's really emotional to see kind of how the family interacts with each other and who Lisa's daughter yeah. ends up being. And um, it was really cool. I, I remember, and Matt, maybe you can chime in on this too, of just like sure. p pitching out, um, you know, future episodes and where Bart is and where Lisa ends up and stuff and feeling this incredible weight of like, but wait, then that's what happens. I mean, then they're, that's their life. Like, can we really make that decision? But now the pressure's off a little bit. It's kind of like, a lot of different futures happened. Yeah. And didn't happen. Also, none <laughs> yeah. of it happened. Um, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> and Matt, you have one coming up this year? That's I do up. on, so I guess I'll say that's my favorite because no one's seen it yet. Um, <laughs> a show called A Summer Christmas in Springfield for Springfield, something like that. That might not be the title. <laughs> I could, find, I could find out. No one, no one cares about the title now. What's the, I know. What's the gist um, of it? it? The premise is that a, a Hallmark-type Christmas movie is shot in Springfield in the summer, and, we, and the plot kind of follows the plot of almost every Hallmark-type Christmas movie of a big city person going to a small town and learning that small town values are the best and having a romance with a hardworking small town guy. <laughs> so, and it's sort of, it's very, I love the word meta. It's very meta. So it's a, it's the, it's a Hallmark movie about the making of a Hallmark movie, but also in Springfield and, and Christmas. Hmm? And Christmas. And Christmas. <laughs> also, there's a B story that does not feel very Hallmarky where Homer gets into the fake snow making business. It's like, <laughs> And is grinding up any anything. That's a very Donic type B story, I would say, where he will grind up anything white yeah, to make great. fake snow. <laughs> I would also throw in the mix, Mr. Plow, um, just as a snow. Yeah. Snow base. Oh yeah, of course. Episode, one of the best. Um, yeah, Donic. In terms of snow-based episodes, in terms of like the die-hard rules of Christmas, I would also put Mountain of Madness in there. Uh, just especially it's very quarantine-y you know Mr. Burns and Homer locked in the cabin together while it's snowing feels very holidays plus 2020 yeah so that mm -hmm. might be a fun a fun rewatch and, and yeah I, I kind of want to take credit for this though I'm not 100% sure but I think I pitched a background joke and now I don't even remember the context so there's a terrible way to take credit for it but is <laughs> the, the Christmas 8 movies that were on a post yeah. background in something in season nine or so but maybe oh I my don't. god christmas ape goes to summer camp that's, that's <laughs> all the ape, all the ape jokes i remember asking when josh weinstein was first on our show we were like why all the apes and he just went apes are funny <laughs> it's as that's simple as that all you need sometimes josh, it's not alchemy <laughs> the first the first episode i wrote um had marge battling champs in a zoo and and um and and saving reverend lovejoy and yeah. uh mm -hmm. but, 
worked with Josh Weinstein on that. And Josh was so funny because he really brought the apes to life in the room. He was like, and then the apes would do this. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I love that. Okay, so let's talk about Simpson gift ideas just for fun. I was, um, I was thinking about one just to kick it off if people have um, a couple things. One, uh, Kid Robot. Yeah. yeah they just did so. these great Mr. Sparkle plushy toys. Which I'm pretty excited about. And then um, the other thing I, I was thinking for gifts, so you can order those from Kid Robot, but also um, you can always make new Simpsons collectibles. This is one my son made a couple years ago. It's called um, Big Big Leg Smithers is what we call it. <laughs> oh, I love that. Oh, no. <laughs> it's, he's, pretty, he's pretty easy to assemble. It's just you find a pair of legs from somebody else. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> That's going to spark a new trend of putting on, like, sexy long legs to characters who don't <laughs> typically have it. <laughs> yes, yes. I can uh, see that on TikTok already. <laughs> uh, in, the, in the vein of, like, kind of homemade gifts that are Simpsons y, Etsy always has, like, so many mm -hmm. amazing gifts. Um, one of the ones that I got was this Kirk Van Houten uh, cassette of Can I Borrow a Feeling? That's good. And on that Etsy train, there's a lot of, uh, there's a needlepoint craze, if you can believe it, on Etsy. <laughs> and um, I feel like I just keep getting tagged on Instagram and like really beautiful detailed needlepoints of like Homer, you know, as a warm toasty cinnamon bun in his bed. I'm trying to find my Simpsons needlepoint that I ordered and I can't find it. Uh, what was oh, what was it? How many people are saying that this morning? Yeah, <laughs> it's of Mo putting his head in the oven and a sign in his back reading "No Funeral." I, that's one of my. Oh, favorites. that's nice. Everyone I loves love that. that. That's a great. That is one. Sonic, of the I love your Portlandia Bart Scampson. <laughs> oh yeah, Scampson. <laughs> yeah, I wore that. I thought we're gonna get into a little bit later. Um, like unauthorized Simpsons, and this is like talk about meta. Yeah. This is like from Portlandia. The episode where they rip off the Simpsons and yes, Ron Levenstein is the yeah. Is the yeah, gonna, yeah. That combines my two loves because I used to be a ska kid in the '90s, early uh -huh. 2000s. So I was like all for it. Oh my I God. convinced Matt to do that. Matt didn't want to do it, and I was like, "You're insane. You have to do. You have to be on that." It. it it made it so great. And I would say also, I was a ska kid, and it blew my mind when it was those two things were crashing. Really? And suddenly, the specials was on the Portlandia, and uh, anyway, that yeah. was. Amazing. Love so that. cool. Um, cool. I love we share that. <laughs> I had one other non-licensed item that I was given. This was this is a unlicensed oh God. Homer bong that somebody uh, uh, actually Yola Tango got for me in in Australia when they were on tour. What? On that tour. That's awesome. <laughs> that <laughs> sentence is insane, don't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So they, they did um they did the theme music for an episode for us and then found that. So. Oh okay. That's so cool. <laughs> so like what the fuck? <laughs> I know. Complicated. The story of the Simpsons bong is that uh nobody actually remembers the story of the Simpsons bong. I've conferred with members of Yola Tango, members of the Yola Tango crew, and memories are hazy, which is somewhat understandable in that we can agree that it happened in the year 2000 so you know it's hard enough to remember earlier this year let alone 20 years ago on october 19th of that year we had a day off in sydney and we attend attended a uh, simpsons gift shop it probably wasn't a simpsons gift shop per se but for us it was, it was some 20th century box, uh, I don't know, theme park or something. But we were there just to buy Simpsons souvenirs, which we did by the bushel. And then the next day we were playing a venue called the Metro in Sydney. And while just walking around the general area, we saw a Simpsons bong for sale, which I think had we not been in the Simpsons souvenir buying groove we might have just like passed up but somehow it just seemed to call out to us I have to say that presumably I, I, I haven't canvassed the entire entourage but I think the purchase of the Homer bong 
brought the total of bongs owned by Yol Tango and Yol Tango crew from zero to one. So, uh, and and we, and then it went back to zero very quickly as we passed it along to to Donick. So that's the best I got. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. I, I was also going to just mention because I guess we're trying to uh, raise money too while we do this. But if you go to musac.org's website, m u s a c k dot org, we're going to have a holiday pop up gift shop, and I'll put a couple of, of these on there that are signed. I'm sure Matt, there's some other Simpson stuff we'll put up there. I don't know what it is. I bug Matt a lot for that, but we'll find something. Um, but we also have a lot of great other things like. Um, members of the Cure signed some records for us. Whoa. Uh, cool. Tim Armstrong si signed a record. We Whoa. got Cruzy signed. We got like the gang from Devo signed a record for us. Whoa. Um, this is cool. This is Malcolm McDowell signed a. <gasps> I want that. And cool. uh, Courtney Love here. We got a Courtney Love signed uh, whole album. Um, Damn. And then uh, the last thing was these are really cool. I was so excited about this. So I saw um, a vintage poster. I, I thought of you, Ali, just because you, you're a uh, pop culture maven. Is I loved MASH growing up. It was one of a thousand shows I loved equally between that and, and Three's Company and whatever. But I saw this vintage MASH, MASH poster from when it went off the air that was this like goodbye and farewell. I thought the poster was so Oh cool. my God. That is so cool. I you love know, that. I, I, I just love that graphic that. design. And um, yeah, my, my buddy, Mike Kroll, who also does the music for the last talk show. Um, I love Mike Kroll. He, he printed some of these for us and remade it and changed the colors a little bit. And then here you can see Alan Alda signed a bunch of them for us. So oh have, my God, that's amazing. Um, we have a few of these one of a kind. I guess there's multiple, but not a ton. Anyway, those will be on the website, plus other stuff and a great way to support the program and get great Christmas gifts. Let's move on to just quickly some family, any great Christmas traditions that you guys have in your families or that you do that you would like to share? Well, in my family growing up, we definitely were very like December 1st uh, is the first day that you're allowed to even mention Christmas. Like we are religiously, it's not the day after Thanksgiving and you can only watch Christmas movies during this time. And my dad, like we would watch a Christmas movie every single day and uh, of the month and, uh, he had told me like, you can't watch it with anybody else, but he meant it more in like a fun way. Um, but when my school in elementary school, I was in like third grade was like, we're gonna play um, uh, Rudolph for the class. I had to like in tears, like tell my teacher, like my dad says I'm not allowed to watch Christmas movies. And so they uh, put me in a room with a few Jewish kids and we all watched Reading Rainbow instead. And my mom like came to the party that the class was throwing with cookies and was just like, where's my daughter? And she's like, well, you know, since she's <laughs> Jewish, we put her in the other room. She's like, that's so wrong on so many levels. When I was a kid, I used to be in uh, a children's Christian choir I don't talk about this <laughs> because it's I think a repressed memory we actually recorded an album um, and, that, and it came out and the only person I knew to listen to it was my late grandma um, and it was also just the dorkiest like up with people Jesus-y stuff but we used to do um, for several years in a row we used to go and perform at this um, Christmas Eve event this concert at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion downtown and it was really cool. It was televised, I think, on like a PBS type channel, um, free, open to the public. But because of that, I just remember one year we uh, performed and I was positioned in the front row and looked out to the audience expecting this like, you know, grand full audience. And it was nearly empty and the only people inside were in like the front row, a man fully asleep and snoring. So I felt like that and planted the seed early on of like, you know, kid, sometimes you prep for Carnegie Hall and then you get, you know, a, a sleepy stranger man. Anyway. I love it. I think, I think I was in a Christian choir uh, and we recorded an album is the uh, sentence you hear a lot at the beginning of therapy <laughs> sessions. <usually>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, Matt, anything you want to share about your holiday traditions? Um, 
you know, it was always like my mom was a big Christmas nut. So we always went in all in. And then when we got older, you know, it was maybe a little harder for my brother and I to sustain the same level of, we were like in college. It was hard to sustain that as maybe many people go through. We just, but then one magical Christmas, my brother and I decided to make an omelet made of two leftover omelets. <laughs> so the first omelet was made of leftover Thanksgiving stuff. And then the second omelet was made of that omelet. So it's just three meals combined in one. We both got hospitalization quality food poisoning. <laughs> oh my God. On, on, on Christmas Eve. And so we're in like emergency, both in emergency rooms next, we're very near each other being rehydrated as we heard Christmas Eve screams and from whatever other horrible Christmas Eves people were having in that emergency room. Wow. As we like, were like unbelievably dehydrated and sick. <laughs> That's and, but it was sort of like it was a kind of like Christmas miracle and that like <laughs> it kind of brought the family back together <laughs> to appreciate <laughs> everything. I love that. <laughs> and the best, maybe the best medical feeling I ever had in my life was the oh boy, the insertion of a uh anti-nausea suppository. Oh my gosh. <laughs> which then once it kicked in and the the unbelievably like you want to die nausea went away. Uh. Relief. That, that is like the best yeah. that is like heroin quality <laughs> relief of nausea fade away and, and that has become a christmas tradition for you right so now i kind of <laughs> I, I munchausen myself every christmas eve to try to make myself sick <laughs> or i i uh phantom threat I phantom thread exactly i phantom thread it <laughs> so that when i heal i feel reborn and alive yeah. again and <laughs> that's hard to top i i my <laughs> The only thing I thought of quickly was just for when I was a kid, we would always read Dylan Thomas's A Christmas in Wales. And mm -hmm. that was a fond memory I had of growing up with my parents. And so I've tried to instill that tradition with my kids and they will not have it. And I mean, I, <laughs> so the tradition now is I sit down and start to read it and then they leave the room and I just read it to myself. And that's, <laughs> that's our Christmas tradition. Let's just share some holiday recipes. Cause we, I threw that out there. I'll get it started with, um, one thing we have certain we have something called big kim's Cras casserole which is my father-in-law makes a casserole out of white bread every every uh, morning I'll, we'll put the recipe up here enjoy that's uh yum <laughs> um and the you're other such a youtuber with that point. <laughs> <laughs> the other one i was gonna throw out my mom used to make uh a uh, bush noel or a, a yule log just a log and that felt like something that you could easily Simpsonify, put Lisa's head on the front and do the Lisa log if you want. Oh, I love that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Julia actually made a um, a really great list of some uh, Simpsons y uh, recipes. I don't know if you wanted to share any of them and we could throw up the oh, image yeah. of it. <laughs> some of these are real silly, but you know, you gotta laugh. have your, your cranberry <laughs> sauce a la Bart, which is just the can. <laughs> Congealed together. Oh, right. Well, um, cranberry and, sauce, and, if I can interrupt for a sec, cranberry sauce oh, yeah. has a symbolic meaning um, in the Simpsons writer's room is that whenever you're whenever you're pitching on something where the level of work required is that of kind of guessing a family feud answer, like what foods that should be on the what's on the Thanksgiving table. You know, thank yeah. actually, it's, it's, it all came back to John Levenstein, who one time I ran I ran into a party and he was in a rage because the terrible sitcom he was writing on was full of unfunny writers who never pitched until it came time to describe the pointless things that were on the prop table of the Thanksgiving. And then everyone started <laughs> like, I can't, you don't need any writing ability able to say stuffing, cranberry. <laughs> so the word cranberry is shorthand for like whenever and this is a kind of pointless, no skill required thing to pitch on. Wow. Mm. Yeah, that makes and sense. Then that, that, I love that. That even came to life more in the, Thanksgiving of Horror episode when there was a literally a evil or not evil, I guess sentient uh, cranberry jelly that came to life and started eating children's bones. <laughs> That's <laughs> amazing. And then, sorry, I'm sorry. Then also for that episode, I emailed John Levenstein. I said, you have to describe all the things that are on the Thanksgiving table for this episode. <laughs> so I forced him to do the thing he, 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 that gave birth to this. I love it meme or whatever you want to call it. Okay, sorry. I bet he, I bet he loved that. 
I was just thinking yeah. back. I, I worked with John on one show, and I believed that I pitched corn. <laughs> <laughs> The next one was eggnog on cereal. Give it a try. Mm -hmm. <laughs> See if it makes you, you know, feel like you have to go to the emergency room, just like Selman did. <laughs> um, and I've tried to make this, but I haven't succeeded. And I feel like I only know a couple people who dabble in this kind of stuff that have. But the giant hot chocolate marshmallow that Bart eats <laughs> looks mm -hmm. so delectable. It looks so good. It just <laughs> makes me wonder why whoever's making the marshmallows in this world, why can't they just make a giant ass marshmallow? <laughs> I see some of those things on TikTok. I see the trends of like, you know, there's a chocolate bowl that you pour hot milk on and then it explodes. I want a giant marshmallow, god damn it. Is there a food Etsy? Because it feels like there should be a food Etsy that you can there just go be. and go like, oh, somebody made crazy blank <laughs> and you can order those. Yeah. That's a great yes. idea. It's just jammed with preservatives so we could travel. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then Little Meatloaf Men, I think is oh, one yeah. of the cutest <laughs> Marge. If you, can, if you can do done. it, do it. Yeah. <laughs> This is a going to be a very confusing section of the show. Who wrote the songs that we're going to watch? Is the, all of them worked the on it kids, together? These kids are all in a music program in the East Bay in Oakland okay, cool. area. And they each have little bands that they do. And, and each of the bands wrote different songs. OK, cool. cool. We'll, Great. we'll meet a few of them. But here they come. Get ready. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hello. Hi, Donick. Hi, everybody. So, well, welcome, welcome to uh, the last talk show, everybody from Three O'clock Rock up in the East Bay, and and Billy, the uh, Billy. What's your title? You're the chief operating executive, music genius, right? I'm just the program director. Program director. That's way easier. We are so excited to welcome all of you. I know you guys have been working very hard on Simpson songs. I'm just admitting more people to the uh, thing as we go. 30 people have joined. Oh, that's awesome. Billy, tell us quickly about the, um, I guess, time out for fun. Let's at least plug that and where people can watch it and what that is. And then tell us a little bit about the, the uh, Simpsons project. Yeah, so uh, time out for fun was a video and, uh, that we made some years ago with Francis Lau, one of our Three Clock Rock students who was big Devo head. And uh, we are also uh, big fans of Devo. And what we wanted to do with that, that, that song and also the video was uh, we wanted to welcome other Devo fans and into our program and to learn more Devo songs. And uh, I think from what that video did, uh, it was basically helped us co co connect uh, students to play in a band, to, to learn songs like by Weird Al or learn songs by Devo, make their own songs. And uh, from that, it kind of spiraled into this like songwriting thing. So uh, our students have been writing original songs each semester during this pandemic. Uh, we did a semester of uh, songs about the Simpsons. That's why we're here. Um, and we've done songs uh, about video games, and we're currently writing songs about our pets this semester. So uh, we're so thrilled to be here. Thank you. How many, how many Simpsons songs are written, and where can people go to listen to them, download, and then also donate to the program? We currently have 14 completed works, um, all by different bands. They're on 3 Clock Rock Records dot bandcamp.com you can listen you can download them for free uh you can share them with your favorite like you know simpson fans uh or your friends uh, your family and if you want to make a donation uh to student scholarships uh you can do that also through our bandcamp page Great, and also um, Muzak.org also supports a lot of what Billy does and Three O'Clock Rock, so you can donate there too, and we can and earmark it for Three O'Clock Rock programs. We do we help them with scholarships and have done a few programs like the Francis Lau. 
videos. Um, it, always excited to work with you guys. Who here is in the Golden Burritos? Why don't the Golden Burritos unmute and tell us a little bit about I Carumba to the camera? Oh, I'm just holding up the uh, the seven inch record that uh, the Golden Burritos made. I Carumba uh, is on one side, and the quarantine <laughs> song is on the B side. Cool. Oh, oh my God, <laughs> that's awesome. That's a great Bart uh, drawing too. Who did the art? Thomas. Thomas did? Hey, Thomas. Hi. So you guys are the Golden Burritos. Tell us what inspired you and how, how you came about this song. Well, we wanted to write about it. Well, well, we wanted to write about it because we thought Bart was like the perfect person for the song. And we like, like, we love The Simpsons show. And he, we just thought he was like a good person to make a song about. Love it, love it. And Miles, did you want to add in on that? Um, uh, it was cool to be taught how to write songs, I guess. And we wanted to write about Simpsons just because, yeah, we like The Simpsons. and. <laughs> It was just something cool to write about. Do you guys have any requests or questions for uh, executive producer Matt Selman of The Simpsons? Hi guys, thanks for watching the show. <laughs> how do you write so many episodes? Like, how do you come up with all the ideas? Um, well, that's the hardest part, right? But you just, you kind of think the trick is to forget the 700 episodes you've already done. Don't think about those. Pretend they never existed. And like you're starting over the beginning of every show with like a brand new family that's never had 700 amazing adventures and a movie and 15 video games. And uh, you just try to think like, what's a, a funny thing from real life, a sad thing from real life, something that makes you angry, something that makes you happy something that happened to you, something that happened, happened to one of your friends, something that's happening now in real life. And you just try to hope that that's like, and then you, and then, and then once you find something you like, then you go back and hope you haven't already done it too many times. <laughs> and then if you've only done it once or twice, yeah, okay, it's all right. <laughs> who, who here on this call has an idea for a Simpsons episode? Anybody? Um, a good idea would be, that Mel is infected by the coronavirus and she passes it on to Bart and then it passes on to the whole town. <laughs> yeah, that has come up. Um, <laughs> that's a good idea though. That's good because you're right, you're, you're observing what's happening in the real world. So that's really important as for like anyone writing songs, writing stories, writing anything, observing the world around you is very important. And you know, we kind of, if you're interested, we kind of made the choice in the show, it's sad, I guess, to sort of pretend that the pandemic didn't happen because our show is just so dependent on people being outside and doing stuff and going to food festivals and crowded, crowded pod, live podcast shows and courtrooms and, you know, we couldn't, we could do, we could do one episode, you know, where there was a sad or funny version of a pandemic, but we have to kind of fingers crossed that someday we will be living in a, and hopefully this will be happening, we'll be living in a, a less pandemic-y world and that these well, people watch these episodes, they'll, you know, feel like some kind of normal thing instead of right now what we're writing is shows that feel like they happened in the past or in the future. I like um, I like the part of your pitch where it starts with Millhouse. That seems very realistic. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Millhouse screwing it up for everyone. I just wrote. We just did something in a show where Mel we revealed that Millhouse is addicted to swim diapers. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You guys know swim diapers, right? You're you know you're you go in the public pool. You're a little kid. You just wear a swim diaper, and there's a little bit of safety there. It's comforting. <laughs> So let's let's take Not a regular at... diapers, swim diapers. <laughs> yeah, we got it. <laughs> and you guys, made, you made a um, you made a music video for I Caramba. So let's watch that now. Let's all. So here's what we're gonna do. Everybody, pretend you're watching it for a minute. Ready? Let's pretend we're watching. Go. Shh. 
guys yeah. so cool. <laughs> it's so good is it fun to see it on the uh, big screen like that it's amazing <laughs> but what it, we want to talk about the the uh, another song you guys did this one is um by e the egos of justice what does it mean to be in the egos of justice and what was it like and why did you make this song which is hashtag homer hashtag hash brown it was one of the songs where um like we put like silly just like funny lyrics yeah. and put and then put like homer stuff in it too and then just like mixed it up and we got a very weird song <laughs> <laughs> we kind of just wrote down whatever came into our heads and it turned out pretty well i think
love it. <laughs> yeah, I love it. And, and let's talk about the video a little bit. It's an amazing video. Who made the, how did you make the video and who made it? Um, I made it and I animated it with Scratch, which is a coding website. Cool. Do you want to code uh, more in your future? I'm not really a coder. I'm more of an animator and Scratch, it's made, it's a coding website, but you can make animations on it. How long did it take you to make that? Um, like about a day. Wow, <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> How long does it take to make a Simpsons episode? Oh, longer than a day. Um, <laughs> usually takes between like nine months and a year. Mm -hmm. but wow. It's, there's a lot of steps along the way. Mm -hmm. so maybe you guys should switch to Scratch. Yeah, Scratch sounds <laughs> better for you guys. I mean, Disney would like that. Yeah. We have um, one kid. We have one kid doing it in his room. They would be much happier. <laughs> or or her room. I just thought the songs were so cool. Um, I I write Simpson songs too, but my songs are um, kind of on the sadder, like folk side of music. And I really liked how upbeat and kind of punk rock these were. And it just had a really um, raw sounding uh, feel to it. I just thought it was awesome. I just want to say mm -hmm. that please keep writing music forever because I'm a new fan. So right on, it was yeah. really cool. Thank you. Yeah, I second that. I really loved, I mean, I loved all of them, but I loved Homer Hashbrand. I loved the explanation that it was just a bunch of like silly random things that you guys came up with and you, you know, mixed it all around. I feel like that impulse as you grow up, you kind of lose that, right? You, you know, go into high school or you go into college and suddenly everything's about rules and you have to like, you know, really memorize these rules and, and live within those lines. But I, you know, want to encourage you guys to hold on to that silliness and to hold on to that impulse of doing things just because and, you know, sort of following that gut feeling because I think that it makes really great art, like that song that you guys made and the animation, which is so cool. I can't wait to show it to um, my husband's an animator and I know he'll really love it. So, yeah. I think that's really good ad advice is, is uh, stay silly. Uh, don't don't silly. forget that. I think Billy, right? Billy, you've Weird. been, in, 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 as a, extreme compliment you've been able to exemplify that so thank you billy for staying silly and um i didn't mean to make that, that was, that was uh, excess but but thank you for that and thanks for inspiring these kids when i first met you donick uh, you had it was your birthday party and you had notebooks in front of every place setting and for all your guests and in your backyard which was a beautiful event and i just was so inspired because on those notebooks uh was a lightning bolt and from that day I met you, I've been writing in my journal. Yeah, that's it. That's the one. There you um, go. There's, there, there's, a, there's a shot of the, uh, yeah, that was the birthday logo. <laughs> I've, I've filled that one out already and moved on to, I have all st stacks of those. And um, anyway, I just uh, felt really inspired by, you know, uh, the idea of writing a little bit each day write your thoughts down. It also goes back to something I read by Neil Young in his uh, uh, huge book called Shaky. And his observations was what Ali, I think, was, or Matt was saying. Uh, write down your observations, anything that you like, you know, just write it into a journal and you can always go back to it and take, you know, look, look at it. And um, a lot of ideas we have, they just, you know, come to us and then we just kind of go about our day and then they, they, they kind of disappear. Uh, we can't always remember all of them. Uh, Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones had a, a tape recorder and he recorded Jumpin' Jack Flash on it one night and he woke up the next morning and he didn't <laughs> remember he had even recorded it. So uh, anyway, I, I, I thank you so much for all of your thoughtful comments and your support for our students writing. Um, I hope they continue being songwriters. I hope they continue creating songs, recording original ideas. Um, and uh, of course, uh, their Simpsons songs uh, will live on the internet forever. <laughs> well, just because you brought it up, just for fun. You know, I, I, people always ask me like, what should I do? I want to be a writer or whatever. And it is, the answer is always write, you know, just keep writing. I was very lucky that early in my career, someone taught me the idea of free writing and that you just, you should always have a journal. You should 
start a timer every day and spend 10 minutes just with your pen to paper without picking it up, getting as much down as you can. And that the, this idea that the future is unwritten, you really get to, to chart a path where you're going to go. Um, but the bigger thing with free writing too is at the end of a week, go back and look at what you've written and take a highlighter and just like, just enjoy that you've already created all this material and highlight some of the best stuff that you're like, oh, that's actually pretty good. And you can then do focused free writes where you hone in on that idea and see what comes out of it. So um, I encourage all you guys to just keep writing, have notebooks, fill them. And every once in a while, a little lightning will strike and that's when you uh, grab it and run towards it. So um, I think three o'clock rock came out of that. Muzak came out of it. A lot of the best Simpsons episodes come out of that. And like I said, Donick, I, I've just been so inspired since the day I met you. Thank you for um, uh, giving us uh, time today uh, to acknowledge the students and their creations. Um, it's so important as these kids grow up to have some uh, support for what they're doing. Uh, as a, a Personally, when I uh, was in sixth grade, I was not the best student in English. I was better in math and I had an English teacher who loved Shakespeare and I didn't. And she put so much red on my papers that I got so discouraged from reading. I got discouraged from writing and I just didn't want to do it anymore. So, um, of course, I, 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 I'm not like that anymore. I write a lot more because I'm doing you know, things that uh, matter to me, uh, writing songs, you know, uh, teaching students how to rhyme. And uh, anyway, thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for making working with words fun for your kids. You've inspired a huge group of kids up there and we love supporting what you're doing. So excited whenever you send us some, a new project that you're working on. So keep up the good work and, and have, let's hope for a great 2021. More music. Yeah. Everywhere. Yes. You're awesome, Billy. And the kids are so cool. I love those songs so much. Legitimate bangers. Really cool. Yeah, right? they're really cool. Hey, let everybody unmute for a second and let and tell us what you want for Christmas. Come on, ready? One, two, three, four, uh, five. A computer. A dog. All right. Merry Christmas, everybody. And happy Merry holidays. Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Thank you Merry so Christmas. much. Bye. Thank you. We Bye. love the Simpsons. Okay, keep on watching, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, like okay. <laughs>